Welcome everyone to today's presentation of Beyond Words, a program of the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts in Beverly Hills, California. I'm Mark Slavkin. I'm honored to serve as Director of Education at the Wallace and wanted to give you a little bit of context uh, before we get started today. The Wallace is a partnership with the city of Beverly Hills which enabled our organization to reimagine a historic post office building as a center for the performing arts. We have two beautiful theaters on, on the uh, stages of which we present amazing work in music and dance and theater. We also present film to share the arts with our Beverly Hills community and the larger Los Angeles region. In addition to the work on our stages, we have a robust commitment to arts learning for people of all ages. And all of those programs are offered in our beautiful education wing under the umbrella of Grow at the Wallace. And the idea of Grow is that all of us, regardless of our age or past engagement with the arts, all of us have a creativity within us and have a right to grow as people and as artists, and then to share the best of ourselves with those around us. So that's the spirit of this program, Beyond Words, which was designed for older adults to really reflect on their lives and their personal stories and use their words and their text and their voices, as well as photos and music and recipes and collage to share those elements of their life that, that they want to share with others in addition to their, their family and, and their friends. So today is the culmination of this class and a chance to share with our larger community the terrific work of the participants uh, in this program. I want to give special thanks to my colleague Deborah Pasquarette, who really imagined this class and has taught it with incredible passion and care and love for the participants. And they've reflected that in addition to growing some skills, tapping into creativity, maybe they didn't even know they had, but they've also cherished the sense to connect with each other during this pandemic. They have a weekly opportunity to feel connected to other people, to feel part of a supportive community it has really been a blessing. So I wanna thank Deborah for making all this possible and now turn it over to her to help get us started. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I think you're in for an incredible gift to yourself this afternoon by hearing some wonderful storytellers. And not only being able to hear their stories, but to see what they have created visually to accompany their stories. As Mark mentioned, Beyond Words is a class that I um, created to not only have storytellers be able to just write their stories or to tell their stories, but also to access some of the other art forms. We've been looking at collage and photography, sometimes people bringing in actual objects, listening to music, writing recipes, using all sorts of other other forms of the arts to inform our storytelling. And today you'll see with each storyteller, there's also a visual piece that goes with that. And we're gonna to talk to the storytellers a little bit about that at the end of the performance. For the last 10 weeks, every, every Wednesday, I almost said Thursday, it is Wednesday, every Wednesday afternoon, this group of incredible women have been together and have shared I mean, everything you can imagine, joys, pain, sorrow. I mean, I don't want to sound like a, a corny, you know, television show, but it really has been the gamut of, of emotion and, and really have been brave and courageous in telling their stories and their truths. And you were lucky today to be able to hear that. At the end of the stories, we will have a quick Q&A with the storytellers. So if anything comes up for you that you want to ask them, please put it in the Q&A section or the chat, and I will be able to facilitate that with the storytellers. So without any further ado, I wanna get on with our very first storyteller and introduce you to Victoria. Hello, I'm Victoria Kemsley, and today I'm gonna to read a story called, How to Change a Family's Destiny in Two Parts. Part one, the recipe. 
take one tough as nails Scotsman, insert the ability to do arithmetic in his head, harness the Gaelic pride and stubbornness into hard work, make him immune to some of the coldest winters on earth, remove all need to complain and any need to explain, grant 160 acres of good top land in the middle of a thousand miles of Canadian prairie for the price of the filing fee, build hand calluses as thick as a horseshoe, spend any ready cash only on equipment and more land, allow him to let off steam fighting in the local bar every Saturday night, give it decades, accumulate 10,000 more acres, never drop the brogue, garnish with a classic white cowboy hat, a Stetson, of course. Part two, the upshot. My brother Graham is on a budget, a word budget. It seems as if he only has a finite number of words to use during his lifetime, as if he must be very careful about where and when and how he dishes them out before he then has to die. Why use 10 words when two will do? Not me, I like to talk. My husband likes to talk. When we go to visit my brother and sister-in-law, we find ourselves filling the silences. Eventually, we start to feel like a three-year-old telling an hours long story about the cartoon their friend from school saw yesterday. Once when they got home from a six week trip to Europe, I asked my brother a leading question. How was your trip? Good. The end. Seriously, that's what you have to share about a six week five country tour through Europe? Good. I give up. My parents talked. My father was outgoing and large and loud and funny. My mother was funny too in a great little chatter. My sister tells long, hilarious stories, but not Graham. He modeled himself after my grandfather. He looked at that tough, silent, determined farmer, farmer and said to himself, this is what a man is. He styled himself as never complain, never explain 2.0. I picture that tough old Scotsman on the frozen windswept prairie of Alberta, minus 20 degrees in January, the snow coming at him from the side, blinding him and burning his face, wearing only a homemade wool coat, hat, and maybe some mittens. No luxurious downfield coat and state-of-the-art water-resistant materials for him. A cow stuck and in trouble in the field? Nothing to do but do it. He didn't say to himself, how do I feel about this? Do I like farming? Should I consider doing something else that expresses my true self? Nope. Nothing to do but do it. Nothing to do but stay out in the unrelenting summer sun with a raggedy horse and a wooden sled to pick rock for days so that next summer you can plant your wheat in that field. Nothing to do but eat your fourth meal of the day out of a newspaper lined box so that the strong black tea in a well-used jam jar stays even a little bit warm and the thick black beef sandwiches a little bit fresh so that you can work until there's no light left in the sky to get that last grain of wheat out of the field in September. Nothing to do but leave your home for a raw new country 4,000 miles away so that down the road, your grandson is not a working class guy like you, a Glasgow day laborer with a grade five education, but is instead a California plastic surgeon on a word budget. Being stubborn as hell can make that happen in just two generations if you shut up and get on with it. It is now my pleasure to introduce your next storyteller, the lovely Angela. Thank you, Victoria, that was wonderful. Good afternoon, I'm Angela and my story is The Neighborhood. 
6.45 in my neighborhood Albertson's Market, prime shopping time for me. I can avoid the crowds, finish shopping, and meet my friend Christy at her home for our walk all before 7.30 a.m. A man who looked to be in his late 70s carrying a handbasket came up to me and began talking. Conversations in my market are not unusual as it's across the street from a senior housing complex. And I believe that some of the residents come to the market for an outing and company. I've had many com conversations in the deli section about the assortment of just baked muffins or the fried chicken and if it's overcooked and too crunchy. In the produce section about the Honeycrisp apples or the availability of romaine lettuce. And of course, in the checkout stand about the hot or cold weather. The man was African-American and introduces himself as Jesse. He was dressed in a nice black gold and red shirt, black jeans and nice black shoes. I say hello and try to quickly extricate myself from the conversation by saying, I'm sorry, but I have to finish shopping because I have to be someplace by 7.30. No time for a muffin discussion for me today. And I begin to walk away. Mr. Jesse hesitantly says, but I need help. I stop and turn to him quickly and ask him, what do you need help with? I immediately begin to reach for the handbasket, thinking that it's too heavy and he needs help carrying it. He says no and looks at me, but not at me and says quietly, I need help buying my food. In a few seconds, a million things run through my mind. I was dumbfounded. How could this nicely dressed man not afford groceries? I felt profound sadness with the realization that not only could he not afford his groceries, but he was probably hungry. Embarrassed at my ignorance for having made an assumption about Mr. Jesse's heartbroken to think how difficult it must have been for Mr. Jesse to put his pride aside to ask a stranger for help. Troubled as I looked into the basket and saw that it was filled with a large jar of peanut butter, a loaf of bread, cans of tuna fish and soup, no meat, eggs, milk, or fresh vegetables, just items that could be stored and eaten over time. I didn't question Mr. Jesse about his situation as I sensed his humiliation would have been overwhelming. I asked him to meet me at the register. I paid for his groceries. He thanked me and left. A neighborhood is made up of people like my neighbors, Carolyn, whose husband Vaughn was literally our neighborhood watch and called the police and then me at work when someone broke into my house and Robin and Rebecca, who call me when I accidentally leave my garage door open. It's also people like Mr. Jesse, who sometimes need help, and the residents from the senior complex who I enjoy talking to at Albertsons. Without people, it's not a neighborhood. It's just a store and a bunch of houses. The neighborhood becomes a community through the acts of kindness that we do for each other. I would now like to introduce Brandy. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank all of you for joining us. I'm Brandy, and my poem is, As a Child, I Dreamed. As a child, I dreamed of scary and romantic fairy tales, dressed up in scarves, flowing like sails. Who were the Queen of Hearts and Alice? Would I ever live in a palace? Was there a prince for me? Was I supposed to just wait and see? Dressing like a bride, playing seek and hide. Many full moons, confusion looms, secrets kept, what to expect? My heart on my sleeve, just trying to believe. It is now my joy to introduce you to Judy. Thank you so much, Brandy. That was lovely. I'm Judy Sell, and my story is what I wish for. Of course, I wish for world peace, a greener earth, that Black Lives Matter, COVID to be gone, hunger and children's diseases to be gone, good health, and for my grandsons to know that humanity exists. But most of all, I wish I had taken the time, taken the time to speak more with my mother. 
I didn't realize until she was gone how much more I wanted to know. I wanted to know who was her first love and what was it like? I wanted to know what her favorite books were as a child, her favorite games. As a young woman, what were the shenanigans she got herself into? Who taught her to play cards? Something she shared with me and then with her granddaughter. I never asked her what her childhood was like, what dreams she had. I knew the stories about how she and my aunt were born late in life to my grandparents and how wild they were in those days. I knew how she met my dad during the war. She explained who was related to whom and told the best stories. But there was so much I don't know. I know she taught us to laugh, even when things were tough. She was always my biggest fan. All my friends envied my relationship with her. When my daughter was born, she was right there with me. She couldn't bear being apart and wound up moving from Phoenix to Los Angeles to be with us. 10 years have passed since she's been gone. I was so busy with my own life that I didn't take enough time. I took her presence for granted. Her always being there for me for granted. We did spend a lot of time together. We spoke on the phone every day. I took her to her doctor's appointments. We had lunch during the week and she had dinner with us every Sunday. Then when my grandsons were born, I had different priorities. I wanted to be by my daughter's side as she held each newborn son, then to babysit or go to the store for her or play hide and seek or build forts with my grandsons. She said she understood. I wish I had taken the time. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Farla Binder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Another opening, another show. It is a sunny spring day in New York City and I am bursting with excitement. I can hardly contain myself as I start counting the hours to the evening's event, the Tony Awards. I have been dreaming about this night all of my life. My love for theater began at an early age. Every summer as a child, my family members would perform our own Broadway shows for the neighborhood at our country home. In addition to working with children in a theatrical setting, I had the opportunity to direct several productions at McGill University. At age 14, I flew to New York to visit my dear Aunt Anne, who surprised me with tickets to my first Broadway show to see the bells are ringing with Judy Holliday at the Schubert Theater. I was mesmerized with the music, the dancing, the lights, and the sets. I have been blessed with three amazing, lovable children. My oldest son, David, graduated from Berkeley with a major in history and business. When he announced he was going off to New York to pursue a career in theater, he caught us totally by surprise. Little did we dream that he would make a successful career as a theatrical producer 
which would also have a great impact on my life. After many successful hits on Broadway, in January 2014, David announced he would produce Hedwig and the Angry Inch with Neil Patrick Harris. In March, I flew to New York for the opening. How could I miss an opening? The show received rave reviews. And there I was, the parent, in the spotlight, receiving accolades from producers, directors, and actors for my son's outstanding achievement. Several days after returning to Los Angeles, I received the exciting news the show was nominated for eight Tony Awards. Without a question, I decided I would return to New York for this important event. Now the pressure was on. I immediately made plane reservations, booked a hotel, and began shopping for a new wardrobe and gown for the big night. The week finally arrived. The plane ride to New York seemed endless. Numerous events, including parties before and after the award ceremony had been planned. I was wined and dined and continuously counting the hours to the awards ceremony. On Sunday, June the 14th, the limo dropped me off at the red carpet in front of Radio City Music Hall. As I entered this legendary venue, I felt like I had stepped into fantasy land. I had butterflies in my stomach. I was nervous. The excitement was mounting. And finally, finally the announcement, the Tony for best revival of a musical goes to Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Davis graciously accepted this award. I was overjoyed and thrilled for him and his success. David had a vision which he was able to fulfill. As we danced until the wee hours of the morning at the party, I thought to myself, it is so hard to believe that I have a son who is doing exactly what I always dreamed of. I am delighted and honored to introduce our next storyteller, Rosemary. Thank you, Farla, and bravo. Ride the mules in the spring of 1981. So many of my coworkers were taking a spring break I decided I needed one too. With a quickly made plan, my daughter September and I hit the road. We had a tight budget, but we're confident there would be plenty of McDonald's and Motel 6s between Seattle and the Grand Canyon. In Los Angeles, we visited our old neighbors, the Joneses, as in keeping up with and saw their new house, pool, Porsche, and small airplane. September learned what living in high cotton meant. In Las Vegas, we won $80 at Blackjack before Caesars Palace personnel invited us to leave. September was 13 and tall. Still, her gambling was illegal and carried a steep fine. Not sure if we could play long enough or win enough to pay for the fine, we accepted their kind invitation to leave. At the Grand Canyon, we decided to soar through the canyon, expecting the IMAX version. Swish, swish. 
It was nothing like that. Instead, we had a 45 minute flight over the canyon, which seemed about 40 minutes too long. We were so happy and chatty when we boarded, but soon there was silence. One canyon wall started looking just like another. The sudden drops in altitude caused by air pockets tossed our stomachs up to our throats. I hadn't noticed before, but there were bird bags surrounding each window. After the flight, while sitting in the car, waiting for our stomachs to settle, September said she didn't believe she would care to have a small plane. The next morning we were due to go on the mule ride. I was still nauseous, but September was fine. Go or not go. I didn't want September to go by herself. So I bundled up in multiple layers. So many layers I could hardly move, let alone mount a mule. While my little Annie Oakley was swinging into the saddle on two bits, I was doing my Carol Burnett mounted mule routine with one cowboy holding the mule's reins while the other was giving me a push from behind. This was a terrible time for September to have the camera. I didn't think the mule ride would help my nausea, so I planned to ride until I threw up, then get off and walk back up. As we rode down the trail, I noticed the hikers coming back up, looking like death warmed over. Well, that mule was a good ride, and I was feeling better. When we stopped for the mules to rest, we were directed to face our mule out over the canyon edge. I'm generally not afraid of heights, but it looks so steep. I was just hoping I didn't have a mule who thought he could fly. I was sure I was going to be in trouble riding a mule named Rowdy on April Fool's Day. Was this a joke between this good old mule and the cowboys? By the first rest stop, Rowdy's tongue was hanging out as if he were exhausted, but he hadn't gone far and that had been all downhill. This mule was just trying to make me look bad. Then while we stood there, he shifted his weight from one foot to the other as if, as, if, as if his feet needed to see a doctor. Hikers would comment on my poor old mule looking so hot and tired. I was worried that if he was this already this tired just going downhill, how was he ever going to carry me back out of the canyon? How embarrassing it would have been to have your mule die while you're riding it. I once had a friend whose dog died on a hike and he carried his dead dog all the way back to the car. But a mule? Sorry, Rowdy, you're out of luck. The one day ride only goes halfway down the canyon and stops to feed and water the mules and the riders too. After our rest stop, we started back up the canyon. When we signed up for the trail ride, we had to sign a release in case we had an accident or died. As we were riding, there was a commotion behind me. And before I could turn to see what it was, the lead cowboy ran past me. Apparently there had been some distraction that startled the mule and its rider fell off. She discovered the number one rule of mule riding, stay on your mule. She was fine, remounted and finished the ride. The cowboys were alert and drive a safe mule train. We continued up the canyon, old hands by now. I soon discovered how Rowdy gets back up the hill. He passed gas the whole way. And as he pooted his way up the hill, September was right behind me, snickering and joking. But there was some justice. While September was being so amused, she seemed to have forgotten 
she was riding downwind. And now to my delight um, and introducing our next storyteller, Judy. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And my name is Judy Donan. And my first very short story about music is entitled Practice. Musical notes magically cascaded down from the open windows of the five-story building on Claremont Avenue in New York, blasting from the rehearsal studios of the dedicated Juilliard musicians were violins, pianos, saxophones, cellos, trumpets, flutes, oboes, a cacophony of dissonant sounds vibrating the atmosphere and enveloping me on the street below with the divergent rhapsody pouring down like sparklers. This elusive performance was abruptly interrupted as I ran inside to be on time for my daily dance classes with Limon and Graham. And my second story is entitled Then and Now. The majestic trees at Idlewild like towering emer emerald structures were reaching for the rays of sunlight. Driving each summer morning on the barren road to my art workshop was in the midst of the breathtaking scent of forest. Rolling down the windows and ramping up the volume on my CD was essential to absorb the music echoing repeatedly throughout the ponderosa pines, dance me to the end of love. No matter what song he created, what poem he mastered, Leonard Cohen resonated intense ballads of hope, longing, and reflection. It was immensely liberating, sensual, promising. 44 years ago, I was a dancer, a believer, a romantic holding on to time. But today, confronted with a vastly different reality, his music video was gushing with the dichotomy of stunning tenderness along with heartbreaking symbols of sorrow, despair, limits, conclusion. My tears were flooding the keyboard. Was I delusional at 36? Idealistic, overflowing with expectations of never ending love? A burning violin meant passion, not consumed in flames. Did I never notice how ephemeral time is? Youthful beauty, silken flesh, passionate love, devoted life. Did I perceive only dance me to the end of that love? Barely considering the implications and conclusion of to the end of love. And now I'm so thrilled to introduce, introduce our radiant Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. That was lovely. My name is Leslie Kyle and I'm reading what I know for sure. I don't know that much for sure. I know that the sun rises and that it sets every day, even when we can't see it. I know that my cat is a pleasure genius. That's what my husband calls him, pleasure genius. Our cat is a guru for living in the present, seeking out what pleases him from moment to moment. Food and water curling up in his fluffy cat bed, which is situated in a warm, sunny, delicious spot, and a shit ton of love and scratches from his humans. Even as I'm writing the longhand version of this piece, Ashy has nestled his way between my body lying on the bed and my notebook and pencil. Smart guy. I know we are born and we die. I know that when you hold a person's head after they die, you are certain they aren't there in that head, that body anymore. How do I know this, you ask? I know this because my dad, 
Sam, had instructed me to do so upon his death. Sam told me that his father, also Sam, Samuel, had told him the same thing. Samuel Sr. told his son, Sammy, my boy, hold my head when I'm dead and you'll never be afraid of death again. I said to my dad, did it work? Sam said, yes. He said he knew for certain that his dad, Sam the elder, was not residing in that dead head anymore. When my sister, Brenda, walked me into the hospital morgue, she guided me to Sam's good side. The ventilator used in the last moments of his life had pulled his mouth down in a kind of frozen sneer. Later, we referred to that as his final fuck you. He had struggled a long time. I looked closely at his face and I said to Brenda, I saw his eyes flutter, he's going to wake up. Brenda gently said as she held my hand, no Lou, he's gone. I looked back at Sam and as I came closer to him, I moved with preordained grace. It was clear what to do. As I held his precious face between my hands, I knew for certain that my dad, my sweet, gruff, fierce, generous, magical, tormented, funny, infuriating, loving dad, Samuel Alexander Kyle, the younger, was not there in that dead head any longer. I guess there's one more thing I know for sure. I now know that Sam resides right about here, in the middle of my chest, in the beats of my heart. And now, dear listeners, it is my honor and great pleasure to introduce the last storyteller in our program. I know you will warmly welcome and listen to Ruth. Judy, thank you so much. Such a beautiful story you tell about your father and your relationship. I'm Ruth Belansky. The title of my piece is, you talking to me, God? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Shehecheyanu v'kimanu v'higiyanu l'azman hazeh. What I know for sure is that other than death, nothing else is sure. Formerly a millionaire, he was found in a large cardboard box outside a hospital. He was Israeli and bipolar. I heard about Nathan, who was suffering from ALS, amytropic lateral sclerosis. I began to visit him in a long-term care facility in Torrance. That first day, sitting in my car with much anxiety, praying in the parking lot to be able to be a presence for him. In the doorway of his room, I saw a large man, thinning dark hair, thick eyebrows, about 50 years old, lying in bed, propped up on pillows, unable to breathe on his own, attached to a ventilator, legs and feet encased in padded plastic holders to keep them from seizing up. Nervous, how was I going to communicate with him? Approaching him, I introduced myself. No longer able to speak, Nathan communicated with his right thumb, up or down, 
or pressing my hand in response to a question. He would also grimace and smile. I visited every Monday afternoon. We developed a close relationship over the next five months, sometimes listening to his beloved Beethoven symphonies. Nathan was not interested in religion or prayer. <laughs> One day, a nurse gave me an envelope addressed to him. Could I write the sender on your behalf, I asked. Smile. I brought a writing pad, asking, can I write this? Suggesting something. Smile. I brought, can I send the letter? Grimacing after a few weeks. He allowed me to send the letter, smiling. Testing to see if he could trust me. The immediate response was from his former mother-in-law in New York. A dialogue began with his ex-wife and two grown children. I asked permission to read Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. Smile. Nathan began a review of his life. Enough suffering. He wanted his life to end. With his doctor present, Nathan's thumb pressed my hand in response to difficult questions. His son, 19, came from Paris. His daughter, 18, from New York, staying with us in our home for three days. My husband and I encouraged them to consider forgiveness and reconciliation with their father. They had only seen their father a few times growing up. This was a tragic, sad, hauntingly final time for them to be with their father. I felt as though I had been swept along on riptides, being pulled under every which way by Nathan's children, the hospital, his wishes, and my work. A week after the children had left, I was at his bedside, along with his doctor. Nathan's wishes were fulfilled. What I know for sure now is that Nathan appeared in my life, causing the river to run deep along the road less traveled. Two years of questioning. You're talking to me, God? Discovering my next authentic self, I became a chaplain. And now it's my great pleasure to first thank Deborah. I know this was not in the script, Deborah, but I want to thank you on behalf of our classmates for everything that you have given us for openings and closings, joyous and sad moments and opportunities.